Remember this passage of scripture? You can all say it, I trust off by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We're continuing our look at John's Gospel. We're still in chapter 4 this morning. Uh, we're moving on from the story of the bad Samaritan woman. Um, we haven't done the good Samaritan yet, but we, we looked at the bad Samaritan woman last week. And uh, we're going to look at Jesus' next uh, work in Cana. God has a mission, always has had a mission from the beginning of creation. To create a community of people that love him and work with him to bring his kingdom here on earth. It started in the beginning, in the garden. And Jesus came to make it even more possible through us. We are here to bring God's rule and reign on this planet. And to introduce people to the glory of God. If we don't do it, they'll never find out. So that's what we're here for. And that's why he sent his son Jesus into the world, not just for the Jews, not just for you and I here, not for you and whoever you are, wherever you worship. He sent his son into the world that whoever, you know, we might be a bit picky about who we share the gospel with, but Jesus isn't picky. And we shouldn't be picky either. We saw that last week he pursued a woman who had a bad reputation. A woman? A woman who had many relationships? A woman who was a Samaritan that the Jews hated? <coughs> Don't know what that noise is, John. Is John still here or is he gone? Okay. It's behind you. <laughs> it's not out there, Anne, it's there. <laughs> gone. There must have been some uh, interruption from somewhere. So today Jesus is going to pursue somebody else. We read at the beginning of last week's story that Jesus needed to go to Samaria. God was compelling him to go after a particular person that he met at a well. And we looked at the uh, similarities and, and the picture painted in the whole of scripture with Jacob's well and the fact that she was after living waters and uh, Jacob met a woman at a well, Isaac met a woman at a well, Jesus meets a woman at a well. And it was all about pursuing an intimate relationship. For Jacob and Isaac it was obviously a wife, but for Jesus it was for the woman to have a relationship with her heavenly father. And that relationship would be blessed with living water springing up from within them. Have you had good cell groups talking about living waters this week? Yeah. Oh, good. Only two of you. Yeah. Okay. It, it's been a fascinating thing to look at for me, particularly the first mention in Scripture and the way to interpret Scripture, looking at the whole book rather than just at the particular passage. Um, and it threw a lot of revelation and light on for me don't know about you lot, but he did for me. And uh, I think it was great. This week, we're looking at Jesus meeting a, another man. Uh, well, a man, not another man. It was a woman last week. He, he pursues after a man who is a royal official. He's actually a royal official of Herod's household. The Herod that beheaded Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. Now, if it was you or I and somebody had murdered our cousin, we might not have gone after them. But Jesus is after this particular person. Again, he was a Roman official, so he wasn't liked by the Jews. But this time, he's a very important person. He's not a bad person in terms of having lots of relationships like the woman. He's a very important, wealthy, influential person in royalty. So Jesus doesn't mind what level of society you're at, he still comes after you. So last week we looked, we, we took comfort in the fact that no matter how bad we are, Jesus comes after us. And no matter how good you think you are, Jesus is still going to come after you. And that, that's what the, today's story 
uh, account of Jesus' meeting with this man is going to tell us. Because Jesus is going after whoever will believe in him. And that's the key point. So I want to ask you, what do you believe? Do you believe in miracles? Do you believe that God can heal you? Do you believe that God wants you to actually go out and heal other people? Do you believe in angels? Do you believe that God can give you a gold tooth? I had one, it's come off. (laughs) Do you believe in the gift of prophecy? Or a word of knowledge? Do you believe in the resurrection of the dead? I hope so. (laughs) Do you marvel and believe that God could fill this room with gold dust or a cloud of glory? Do you believe that God can make you prosperous? You believe some wonderful things. And they're all available to us. And God blesses us with all those. But believing in those things will not save you. It's believing in Jesus. And who he is. The Messiah. The Christ. The Saviour of the world. We can believe in all sorts of things. But only Jesus will save us. And Jesus is after people who ever will believe in him. Many churches are just after pursuing the signs and wonders. And I'm pursuing signs and wonders. And we're pursuing signs and wonders here. But we're doing it for one reason only. So that people will believe in Jesus Christ. As their Lord and Saviour. Signs and wonders point to the fact that we have a good, good Father. He wants to bless, heal, deliver, restore and just change people's lives but he does it so that we can show and reveal the goodness of our father to the world around us you know in the lamp there's a sign that points towards St Ives and wouldn't it be stupid if I loved the sign and worshipped the sign but never went to St Ives Because so many people are just chasing after the signs. Unless they go after what it's pointing to, it would be absolutely stupid. I'm sure there's nobody like that here this morning. But the sign points to the ultimate goal. Jesus Christ, our Heavenly Father, Saviour of the world. We're going to look at uh, the bit of the end of the passage of the bad Samaritan woman. Um, because we didn't read this last week notice what happens and many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified he told me all that I ever did their first belief was in the word of knowledge that Jesus had about her relationships they believed the woman about this man who had a word of knowledge they believed the sign that she gave testimony to so when the Samaritans had come to him they urged him to stay with them and he stayed there two days that's an incredible thing that these Samaritans who hate Jews and Jews who hate Samaritans actually want this guy this rabbi who had a word of knowledge to stop with them for two days and explain the gospel to them and many more believed because of his own word they believed his words and his teachings but that's not enough and then they said to the woman now we believe not because of what you said For we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Saviour of the world. Wow. The first people that have come to that conclusion in John's Gospel are Samaritans. The Pharisees in Jerusalem hadn't come to that conclusion. All the religious people hadn't come to that conclusion. The Jews hadn't come to that conclusion. Jesus' own brothers didn't even believe that he was in in the initial stages he was Christ, the saviour of the world they actually said to him somewhere uh, we believe you are a miracle worker therefore go into all Judea and make a name for yourself they believed he was a miracle worker but they didn't believe at that stage that he was Christ, the saviour of the world 
I, I just find it incredible that Jesus reveals himself to the most unlikely of people and they come to the conclusion which most of us logically should have come to ages and ages ago. But Jesus is still pursuing people today that may believe the signs but he wants them to believe more than just the sign. John's Gospel is written with us that purpose as we've said frequently as we've looked at this Gospel in chapter 20 verse 31. I write these things so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Saviour of the world. In John 43, 45, another interesting thing comes up. It says, and now after two days he departed from there, that is being with the Samaritans, and went to Galilee. And Jesus testified that a prophet was, has no honour in his own country. Does that make sense to you? Jesus is going to a place where he knows that people will not honour him and believe him. How many of you have trouble going to some people to share the gospel because you think they're never going to believe you? you know, Jesus knew that. But he still went. He still went after people who would not believe him. And he knew because he's God and he knows all things. He knew who would believe and who wouldn't believe. But he went. The, and then it says, so when he came to Galilee, the Galileans actually received him. Why? Because they'd seen the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast. They'd seen the signs and the miracles. They received him because they liked what he did. But they didn't receive him because they knew who he was yet. I think those strange two verses between our passages when we come to the story of the nobleman. See, there are so many people in this world that have had seen miracles but still, not, still do not believe in God. Unfortunately, there are some Christians who actually think they are believers because they've seen a miracle. But it's what is belief? Belief is actually having faith, knowledge in who he is, and submission to what he requires of us. Belief is demonstrated by submission to his lordship. And that's where so many of us fall down from time to time. Jesus said an interesting thing about three towns in Galilee. These are the towns where he knew that people would not believe in him. It's in Matthew's Gospel. We've got it up here. It said, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in that day of judgment than you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have, been, would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Three towns along the coast of the Lake of Galilee, the area which Jesus is about to go to, and he has to say woe to them, because they're about to see many signs, and they won't believe and it would be worse for them than it was for Sodom. It would be worse for them than it was for Tyre and Sidon. Scary worse, isn't it? Jesus did signs and wonders to bring people to believe in him. But also to show God's love, mercy and goodness to the people around them. He healed many people, not all of them according to the Bible, would have necessarily have believed in Jesus Christ as a saviour. So we still go into the world as his ambassadors to share the gospel and to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to raise the dead, whether they're going to believe or not. Why? Because I actually think that even if somebody is raised from the dead and they don't believe, the people around them will probably believe that Jesus is a Christ. 
Our job is to reveal his glory, his goodness. Let's have a look. Let's read this one together. This is the main part of our text for this morning. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had met the wa- made the water into wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he had got better. And they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to his son, saying, Your son lives. And he himself believed, and his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea to, into Galilee. Wow. See, that guy went through a period of growing in faith, didn't he? He believed that what Jesus said was going to happen. What did he have to do? He had to submit and obey and go back to his son. Most of us will stop there until we know and see the answer. But Jesus is sobbing. He says, no, I'm not coming. Well, he didn't say that, but that was effectively what he was saying. I'm not coming. I don't need to. Just go and your son lives. And then he believed in Jesus as the healer. Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus as the saviour. And all of his household came to faith. Because they saw the miracle too. This is a son who's in Capernaum, one of the places that Jesus said woe to. But also in an influential palace of Herod. Jesus went after him. The story actually tells us a number of things about the nobleman, which strictly translated is a royal official. His son is in Capernaum, a city in which Jesus knew there was great unbelief. Yet he still performed a miracle in Capernaum. The royal official was possibly Roman. We're not 100% sure about that, or the theologians are not 100% sure. But it was definitely of Herod's house in Tiberias. This is the Herod, as I said earlier, that beheaded Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. Not John Berryman, I know I've only just put JB up there, haven't I? <laughs> Sorry, JB was our previous pastor. <laughs> He's not beheaded, he's fine. <laughs> the, 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 this nobleman was in a personal crisis. Very often people do not come to Jesus until they're in a crisis situation. His son was on the point of death and uh, the man did the right thing. He went to the person who could heal him. But he he actually found out more than that Jesus was just a healer. And he he receives there the greatest words of hope. Your son lives. And he has to obey the voice and go. He could have stopped there and said, no, I'm not going anywhere till you come to my son. I don't believe it's going to happen. But he took that step of faith. There were always small steps of faith of us going and asking Jesus and then believing what he says. You know, there are things in your life today that you've probably waited for an answer for and Jesus has said, it's going to be alright. And you're not satisfied with it's going to be alright. You want it to happen now, at this moment in time. And you've still got to live. Believing, if he said it's alright and it's going to be resolved it's going to be resolved and so we should be living positively in the victory of what Jesus has said 
But how many of you live in the circumstances and think, oh, I can't take it anymore? Because we, we've all been there, haven't we? We've all been there when we think, I know you said it's going to be all right, but it's not all right. But he will sort it out. It also tells us something about Jesus. It says that he is all-knowing. John 6, verses 64 and 65 says, But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. Jesus knows who's going to believe and who's not going to believe. It could be scary, scary that Jesus knows everything, or it could be a great comfort to you, depending on how bad you've been this week. <laughs> but he knows everything. You know, he'll tell you to go and share the gospel with somebody, and he probably knows that that person is not going to believe. You may know that they're not going to believe, but are you going to be willing to obey him and go and share that word? That's a challenge for us. Obviously, Jesus demonstrated his sovereignty. He did not yield to the nobleman's desire for him to go. Jesus did not need to go. Jesus just needed to say the word and it would happen. And because he's all-powerful, omnipotent, distance doesn't matter, does it? You know, we pray for Richard, who's at home this morning. That's only a short distance. But it doesn't matter. The word will go and the word will do its job. We pray for uh, Christopher, who's in Trelesque. Doesn't matter, the word can go and the word can still heal. Because Jesus is everywhere. And he is incredibly gracious. Who would imagine that he was willing to heal the son of somebody who perhaps colluded with Herod in the beheading of his cousin? He was also good to that nobleman, despite his history, his relationships. The state of his spirituality, whether he'd sinned that day or not, Jesus showed God's goodness to that man's son and to that man. <laughs> Remember another man who had a bit of difficulty believing, Thomas. This again shows us that Jesus knows everything. After eight days his disciples were inside and Thomas was with them. And Jesus came and the doors being shut and he stood in the midst of them and said a crazy thing. Peace be with you. He just walked through the wall. <laughs> peace be with you. He probably said peace be with you because they were all going <laughs> seeing a ghost. And then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving but believing. See, Jesus knew that encounter Thomas had had with the disciples when he wasn't there on the first occasion. And what he'd said, because that's what he wanted to do. And then Jesus scares the life out of him and turns up in the middle of the room and says, put your hand here. What would you have been thinking at that moment in time? I don't need to put my hand there. The fact that you're stood in front of me. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. That was Thomas's time of conversion in many ways his repentance and not believing that Jesus had rose from the dead he now turned and believed that Jesus was risen from the dead and Jesus said to him Thomas because you have seen me you have believed blessed are those who have not seen and believed that means you and I are more blessed because we've not seen yet I trust you all believe There are some other verses. What are the benefits of believing in Jesus Christ? Yet to all who received him he gave and believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's John 1 12. John 10 26 says, If you don't believe, then you're not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. If you're not hearing his voice, you need to find out whether you really believe. 
And then John 8, 24. If you do not believe, then I, then I am, Jesus uses that phrase, which ties in with his father, ye shall die in your sins. See, people who believe obey what God calls them to do. We've got many stories in the Old Testament, and I'm, I've got my new Bible, and another hundred pages at least have been coloured in this week as I've uh, devoured the Word. And I, I just love to colour themes in, and I've been looking at faith in the Old Testament, and I've been in Exodus this week. Obviously, Abraham believed, didn't he? And left his hometown and went to a far off country. He believed in his old age that he would have a child with an old woman who was barren. So he must have done something to help it along the way because he believed what God had said. Yeah? Moses believed that God had called him to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. I bet he wish he hadn't believed that sometimes with the way that the Israelites on their journey moaned and groaned at him and at God. But isn't it incredible how he intercedes so often and spares them from the judgment of God? Here's an interesting slide. slide. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered the people together, all the elders of the children of Israel, and Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. That must be really annoying. Moses had said, I can't speak. <coughs> Yet God said to Moses, You tell Aaron what I said. So Moses could speak, but he could only speak to Aaron. <laughs> Ever feel as if you've lost a gift because you said, I can't do it, and somebody else ends up doing it for you? Then he did the signs in the sight of the people, so the people believed. What did they believe in? The signs. I'm not convinced that they actually believed that they were going to get out of Egypt. I'm not convinced that they believed they were going to get into the Promised Land when they were in the wilderness. They believed the signs, and the signs were fantastic. I was going to fetch my staff this morning and cast it on the ground and see if it turned into a snake and see how many of you could actually believe that God said, when God said pick it up by the tail how many of you would pick a snail up a snail, <laughs> snail. Yeah, you'd pick a snail up by the, a snake up by the tail so the people believed and when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he looked on their affliction then they bowed their heads and worshipped they knew that God was interested in them but did they believe, really believe, that God was actually going to save them? This is the same question we face. You know, we know that God loves us. We know that God sees all of our problems. Do, but do we really believe that God is going to deliver us from those problems? Or has delivered us from those problems? You see, the signs held their attention. The signs held the attention of the Egyptians who were suffering under the plagues. It's interesting in Exodus 8, 18 and 19. Now the magicians so worked with their enchantments to bring forth the lice, but they could not. This is the first sign that they could not repeat that Moses and Aaron did before Pharaoh. So there were lice on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. They recognised that God was in this. But Pharaoh, his heart grew hard. And he did not heed them, just as the Lord said he would. Isn't it interesting the way that God goes after a man he knows isn't going to believe and let his people go. And he keeps on having to push and push the door. <coughs> the purpose of the signs, of God's signs, was to get the attention of the people of Israel, to get the attention of the people of Egypt, to get the attention of Pharaoh, and to point to the sovereignty of God. I think after all that they went through, they should have believed in God. But they only still believed in the signs, to the point where they didn't want any more signs, they let the people go. They weren't letting the people go, because God said, let my people go. 
So are you believers this morning? What is a believer? What does it mean to be a believer? Well, we, we all know Hebrews 11, don't we? First verse. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. And in the New, New American Standard Version it says, the conviction of things not seen. Or the substance of things not seen. I like the word conviction. Assurance is a concrete foundation. The word of God, the commandments and the promises and the character of God are concrete certainty. Do you believe it? Well, are there some of the commandments or things that God has said that you don't want to believe? You see, you can't pick and choose, can we? We've got no loose leaf Bibles. God's word is God's word. It's solid. You can place your life and bet your life on it. All those promises in there. How many of them have you claimed and seen come to fruition this week? It says, it's the conviction of things not seen. Exactly the same thing. We can bank our life on it. If God has said it, it will happen. It might not happen when you want it to happen, but it will happen. We can stick to the word of God because it is good. Who's good? God is good. All the time. God is good. Come on, you're a bit slow this morning. Have I been going on too long? Oh, no, not yet. <laughs> you see, human faith is actually faith by experience. You had faith in that chair this morning, but when you sat on it, that the chair would hold you up. Why did you believe that? Because you've seen other people sit on the chair. You know that they've designed the chairs to hold you up. But you know what? Sometimes chairs give way. Because they're technically faulty or they're broken. So your faith could be misplaced. Now it's not the same with the word of God. The word of God will hold you up. It's not technically faulty. It's not been broken. It will hold you up. You might go to a lovely restaurant. Eric and Mary went with John and Anne to a restaurant the other day. They had faith that they were going to be served a meal that was good and it wasn't going to poison them. Why? Because the restaurant had a five-star rating with the environmental health that they had good food hygiene practices. And you know what? It could have gone wrong on the evening, couldn't it? Thankfully, they were not poisoned. They're still here. But you can't... Human faith is based on experience of what's happened before and what you know about situations. But supernatural faith, which you all should have, believes in something that you may not have experienced before or you've only experienced part of God's word coming into being. Hebrews 10 verses 38 and 39 says... But my righteous one, that's you and I, will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, God will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we are those who believe and are saved. We have persevering faith. If you know Jesus, you will persevere in believing what his word says. How am I doing? Okay. See, God has a purpose for signs and wonders. To lead people to repentance. To change their mind about who's in control. You're not in control. God's in control. Amen? Amen? You don't have all the answers. God does. His word is right. Your word, so often, is wrong. And his purpose is so that the whole world will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. You are the glory of God when you're doing what he asks you to do. But the signs and the wonders, we know from Moses' encounter when he asked to see God's glory, God showed him his goodness. So all the good things that God wants to do for you and I, 
is to reveal his glory, his goodness to the people around us. So it's incumbent upon us to do signs and wonders. Yeah? So that people will know the glory of God. Wherever we are, in our spheres of influence, those people need to see the goodness of God manifest through us. That's a big challenge, isn't it? So we've got to believe it, and we've got to get out and do it. Because it's told us we can do it, so we need to do it. Guess who fails? You know, in Luke uh, chapter 5, my last scripture for this morning, we read a story when Jesus got into the boat, one of the boats which was Simon's and asked him to put out a little from the land and he sat down and taught the multitudes from a boat and when he had stopped speaking he said to Simon launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch notice the word nets Simon says master we have toiled all night and have caught nothing nevertheless at your word I will let down the net now depending on what translation you've got some of them just say nets all the way through but looking back at the Aramaic it's nets that Jesus tells them to put down and he puts down one net so he's being obedient and he's taking an, a step of faith which is good and when they had done this they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking so they signalled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. See, this is Peter's turning point. He receives a sign of great number of fish that he turns and realises who he is and who Jesus is. This is his point of repentance now I wonder what would have happened if he had let down lots of nets it had probably had more fish and more boats would have begun to sink but Peter, Jesus is about to call Peter to be fishers of men he's saying if you obey me if you have faith in me if you know who I am and do what I tell you you will have a great harvest of fish. You know what? He's saying that to you and I today. If you obey me and do what I say, fish where I tell you to fish, evangelise where I tell you to evangelise, there'll be a great harvest. And we go out once a year for one and cast a line. I'm sure you don't. I'm sure you do more than that. But this is what Jesus wants us to do. And he's given us all the tools. He is omniscient, all-knowing. He knows where you need to go. You've probably got your own idea how you're going to do evangelism. You've probably got your own idea as to who you're going to go and lay hands on to be healed. Let's ask him. Because if we obey him, I'm sure it'll be a lot more effective. I think it's a great story to encourage us just to do what he tells us to do. If we want to see more people saved, which we're going after this year, we go after all the time, but we're going to go after it big time this year. And that will involve laying hands on people in the streets and seeing them healed might involve you going to a funeral parlour and raising the dead I don't know why not I was reading the story of the Jesus raising the widow of Nain's son you know, open coffin, walking through the street I wonder what the people thought he says, arise and he sits up and starts talking to them that would cause a few stories to be in the newspapers, might it or do you think they'd squash it just in case somebody might believe Jesus told them to catch fish. Why? Because he wanted to make a point. 
I don't think he was hungry that he needed that many fish. He wasn't going to stop around and fillet them and sell them and market them, was he? I wonder what happened to them. I expect Peter left them with the other fishermen that weren't following Jesus for them to profit from it. But that's all those fish that these disciples caught because of their obedience to Jesus will have had an impact on the whole fishing community. There's the master fisherman, Peter. Been out all night, caught nothing, and at one word from Jesus, catches a massive catch. I wonder if they threw away their fish finding satellite things that you get these days. I'm just going to pray and ask Jesus, oh, there's balloons in the roof. I'm just going to pray and ask where the fish are. You know, there was a man called Billy Bray who came to St. Ives one day to raise some money to build a church. And there'd been no fish caught for quite a period of time. So he prayed because the people were poor and he wasn't going to get any money because they hadn't had any food. So he prayed and that the following day they caught 8,000 barrels full or hogsheads that they were called of fish. That was a miracle in St. Ives. It's a shame that it's 150, 160 years ago. Why is it not? Why, why are we not doing it today? God has different times and different plans. So do you want to see many saved? Do you want to see God's goodness, God's glory revealed to the people around you? All we need is faith and obedience and believe that he is Jesus Christ, saviour of the world, healer, restorer, baptizer, giver of the Holy Spirit, can do all things, knows all things, has all the power. And you, because you believe, are his children and can go out and do these things. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you.